Welcome to the next lecture in microbiology. What we're going to be looking at today is the organization and function of the microbial genome. So let's take a look to see uh, some of the genetic elements that are found in microorganisms. So let's start by taking a look at the kinds of genetic elements found in organisms. The chromosomes contain the genetic information that most organisms have. In all organisms like viruses, double-stranded DNA make the genetic material for the chromosome. In prokaryotes, the chromosomes are usually circular, though some of them are actually linear in very few cases. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are exclusively linear chromosomes. The other element that I would like to point out to you are going to be plasmids, and plasmids are very common in prokaryotes, including bacteria and archaea. They are rare in eukaryotes, except sometimes maybe on yeast they have been described uh, to contain plasmids. They are short and circular, or sometimes they could be linear, they're extra chromosomal, and they usually have information that is beneficial but not essential for the cell. Now, organelles in eukaryotes do also contain double-stranded DNA elements that are also circular, as opposed to having the linear type of chromosome that the cell has. Viruses, on the other hand, are the only entities that have genetic material that is not double-stranded DNA. They have either single or double-stranded DNA or RNA as genome, and it has been shown to be either circular or linear. Now, eukaryotes are going to be having chromosomes that are linear, and as you can see from this image, during mitotic compaction, the chromosome is going to be condensed to allow it to be separated into two daughter cells. On the other hand, on the left, you can appreciate a, eukary a prokaryotic chromosome, which is completely circular. Now, this table that is from the previous book shows uh, the different kinds of genetic elements that you can find in bacteria and eukarya. So, one of the things that I would like to point to you is that organisms that are prokaryotes have only usually one chromosome. There are a few exceptions that has two. However, eukaryotic cells tend to have multiple number of chromosomes and all of them are always linear. Here is an example of the chromosome from E. coli. This is E. coli strain K12, which is one of the most used strains in research. This is a 4.6 million uh, base pair chromosome and it contains about 4,288 genes, about 88% of the genome. It's made of open reading frames and genes. 1% of this chromosome is encoding tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs. Every single circular chromosome has an origin of replication shown here in red, and that is the area where the replication of the chromosome will begin, and we're going to be seeing that in a moment. The other thing that I would like to point out to you is that the genes in the bacterial chromosome are organized in functional clusters called operons. And what I want to show you, for example, here is an example of the His um, operon that contains the His G, D, C, B, H, A, F, I, and E genes. So all those genes are under the control of a singular regulatory region. So they eventually, when the region gets activated and transcribed, all those genes are going to be transcribed together as a single unit in one single RNA molecule, which is very different from the way that transcription works in eukaryotes. So when we think about how the chromosome replicates, we're going to look that the circular chromosome has a single origin of replication, which we call the ORI area, whereas eukaryotic chromosomes have multiple regions to allow for the fast replication of the genome, since the genomes are usually a lot larger. So here at the beginning on the left, what we have is the, the typical circular prokaryotic chromosome with the replication origin in green. And over there, it's where you're going to have the initiation of replication, generating a replication fork. What we're going to see is that you're going to create a theta structure, shown over here in the middle, and eventually the two daughter chromosomes are going to be separated once replication stops. In the other hand, the linear eukaryotic chromosome has multiple origins of replication shown over here in the spots where you can now see the replication force to begin. Eventually, as replication continues, those origins of replication, this, uh, replication for, excuse me, are going to meet up and eventually the two chromosomes will be completely separate. That allows for the fast 
replication of the chromosome because to begin replicating the chromosome from only one site will significantly delay the replication process in eukaryotes. So prokaryotes require a different replication mechanism than eukaryotes because of the structure of their chromosome. Remember, the chromosomes are circular in prokaryotes versus uh, linear in eukaryotes. So as the replication machinery binds to the origin of replication and initiate a replication fork, the DNA is going to be spooled through this replication complex. In blue, you have the parental strand, and in red, you have the newly synthesized strand. Eventually, the replication machinery continues until it finds an area termed as TER. TER it stands for termination, and in that point is when the replication machinery will fall off and disengage. But that leaves the chromosomes uh, interlocked, and eventually, to the uh, effect of the enzyme topoisomerase summaries too, you're going to have the elucidation of the two chromosomes as independent units. On the other hand, the linear chromosomes, as I mentioned, have multiple origins of replication, where the replication can then begin. And once the parental strands have passed through, the replication fork basically falls off. So you do not have the same problem of untangling the chromosomes as you have in prokaryotes. Now let me show you here um, the same table that I showed you a little bit before, and let me introduce you to two bacteria. Here is for the Bacter spheroides, which is a gram-negative phototrophic bacteria, and it has a genome of about 4 million, but it has two chromosomes. Um, the other one, Halobacterium, um, is a microorganism that we have discussed. It's an archaea that lives in very high cell concentrations, and it has three circular chromosomes. Remember, the difference between a chromosome, which is circular, and a plasmid, which is also circular, is the fact that the chromosome has essential genes. Without them, the microorganism won't be able to live. The plasmid contains genes which are beneficial but not essential, and that will be the main definition between the main difference between the two genetic elements. So let's just take a quick review about the DNA molecule for you. As you remember, the DNA molecule is made of two antiparallel strands which are interlocked around each other and are maintained together by hydrogen bonding between complementary bases. So a base of A always pairs with a T by two hydrogen bonds, and a base of G always pairs with a C by three hydrogen bonds. The bases, the nucleotides in the DNA, are linked together through phosphodiester bonds that are linking the three prime hydroxyl of one nucleotide with the five prime phosphate of the next nucleotide. That is what gives the um, the DNA, it's five prime to three prime direction. Five prime at the beginning where you have a free phosphate and three prime at the end where you have a free hydroxyl group. Now, the way that the base is stacked, they do not face each other as shown in this image at a 90 degree, uh, 180 degree angle. They actually are facing each other at a broader angle and that broader angle gives the DNA a particular structure that contains a minor groove shown here in the middle where you can basically see very little of the bases and a major groove which has a much broader angle where you can appreciate a lot more of the bases here. Now it takes 10 bases for an entire turn of the helix and the length of one turn of the helix is 3.4 nanometers in length. Now if we were to take the E. coli genome which is 4.6 million bases and we multiply that by the um, length of what it is 3.4 nanometers and meters we get that the bacterial genome is only 1.5 millimeters in length but when we look at human the human genome uh, with its three times 10 to the nine base pairs comes to be about a meter long so try to think about the fact that you have a genome in E. coli, which is 1.5 millimeters long, and the microorganism itself is only two micrometers, which is a thousand orders of magnitude smaller. And think about our cells, which are 10 micrometers in length, having a DNA molecule that if we were to put it from head to tail, that is 1.02 meters in length. So that is the process that I'm going to mention in a moment 
which, con uh, which involves the DNA compaction. So let's take a moment to review how DNA compaction is uh, happening in eukarya and how the molecules are organized inside the nucleus. So in the eukaryotic chromosomes, as you remember from bio2, are organized around nucleosomes. So the DNA is uh, organized about a hectomer of, of histone molecules, two molecules of histone 2A, 2B, 3H, and H4. Shown over here in yellow, red, blue, and green. Now the histones are positively charged. And if you remember the DNA backbone, because it has phosphates, is negatively charged. So you will have 1.67 left-handed supercoiled turns around a histone octamer, shown here from the front or over here from the side. So the nucleosome as a whole is going to have about 146 base pairs of DNA wrap around the histone core. Now, the histone cores, the nucleosomes are organized themselves together linked by histone one, which is going to now help uh, compact further the histone wrap DNA into what we call the 30 nanometer uh, structure, which is going to be a more tight coil. So that histone one is involved in the nuclide, in the compaction of the chromatin, and is going to help the DNA um, be compacted when it needs to be um, replicated. So what we have here is this image are two different forms of DNA. B is showing you what we call the, the beads on a string, which is basically the DNA molecule wrap around independent histone octamers. The histone octamers, as you can see, are shown over here, and you have about 53 bases in between them. So from beginning to end, you have around 200 bases from the beginning of a histone to the next one. So 200 bases, and the little um, nucleosome, it's right in the middle. Now when you add histone one, that is going to make the strand wrap around more tightly into this other structure shown here in A, which um, it's the one that is 30 nanometers in, um, in size, and it's a more compacted version of DNA. So this is going to be shown in the next image. Sorry, in the next one, image after this. So chromosome organization is important. Here on the left, we have the DNA chromosome uh, of a cell that is not undergoing mitosis, and therefore the DNA is not compacted. You can see the strands and the entire molecule just peeling out. And on the right, you can have the compaction of one chromosome, which is about 10,000 folds shorter than the relaxed version. So the chromosome organization and condensation are necessary to keep this very large molecule compacted in order to be segregated to the daughter cells. So here is what the image that I was talking to you about, about the DNA compaction. So you're going to have multiple levels of compactions to get the, the chromosome completely compacted and the DNA shrunk down to a size that could then be uh, segregated during mitosis. So the first step is to wrap the DNA around histones, and that gives you um, about an 11 nanometer in diameter structure. When you add histone one, that is going to now wrap itself more, generating the 30 nanometer chromatin fiber that is compacted. Eventually, that it's compacted further, and that compaction is going to now uh, be eventually wrapped around itself one more time until you get the entire mitotic chromosome compacted. So that is about a 10,000 fold shorter length than the original DNA molecule. But what we're going to see is that that is not the way in which DNA is compacted in prokaryotic organisms. Just to remind you, and as I mentioned to you, from histone core to histone core, we're going to have around 200 nanometers in diameter. And if you were to add a nuclease, an enzyme that can break down DNA, and now allows you to have the uh, histone cores together, what you can get at the end are smaller um, chunks of DNA that are about 200 bases in increment because you have either one bead or two or three, and that is why the ladder shown here in A goes up in about 200 base per increments. 
So now let's take a moment to look at how the, the prokaryotic chromosome is organized, which are you going to appreciate is very different than the eukaryotic chromosome. Histones. Prokaryotes do not have them, except our, some types of archaea have histones, and that's why we believe that the nuclear organization derived in eukaryotes was derived from archaea. So the bacterial chromosome and most of our archaea chromosome are organized and compacted through supercoiling. Here in the left, we have an image of a supercoil. As you can see, it's a image that is showing like a rubber band that has been twisted into small knots. And if you relax this um, chromosome by inducing a small nick in one of the strands of the DNA, the molecule is able to unwind. And when it unwinds, it becomes a relaxed circle. So here on the right, I have an image of the relaxed circle chromosome. And as you can see, there is a breaking of the phosphodiester bond of only one of the strands. That is sufficient to allow the unwinding of the supercoil molecule into a circular molecule. So the DNA can be compacted in bacteria either by having a negative or a positive supercoil. The negative supercoil, the DNA is twisted about its own axis in the opposite direction from the double helix. As you remember, the double helix is a right-handed helix. In the positive supercoil, the DNA is now coiled in the same direction as the helix, so it's going in the right form direction. Now, the negative supercoiling is the most common in all the microorganisms that you will encounter. Some hyperthermophilic archaea have, super, uh, have positive supercoiling, and that allows them to increase the resistance of the DNA molecule to heat. So when we look at a chromosome and we begin to unwrap it, that is going to cause some tension in the two strands. So here you have your DNA that is linearized. So let's make it into a circle. Now you can see the positions of the DNA, 1 to 5 to 10, 15, 20, and 25. Here is they're showing up in the turn molecule. Now, if you unwind it, you are going to add negative supercoils into the DNA molecule. So that is going to add two right-handed turns by one simple unwinding. We're going to see that, why that is the case in a moment. Here now you can see that the uh, molecule has been opened up and when you allow it to be supercoiled, look at the position of the DNA in comparison to the circular molecule. So position 1 and 4 are in the same side versus position 21 and 8 and position 13 and 16. So the right hand coil is going to now compact the size of the DNA molecule compared to the circular molecule. If you look then at the bacterial chromosome, it is arranged in multiple supercoiled domains. It's just not a simple domain. Here in this image, what we have is a bacteria that is dividing. So you have two nucleoids inside. And if you look at one of those nucleoids, those nucleus contain a chromosome with small supercoiled domains that are held together by proteins. Those supercoiled domains were generated by the supercoiling mechanism, which is going to be generated by topoisomerase. And topoisomerase basically generates this by forming a nick and then winding the DNA around itself to generate a helix. And that is going to uh, allow the molecule to then completely supercoil. We're going to look at that in a moment. So here's the enzyme DNA gyrus, which is a topoisomerase 2. And it is showing here how it is introducing negative supercoil. To generate a negative supercoil, the enzyme is going to take the chromosome and lay it over itself and then create a double-stranded DNA break and then fix that double-stranded DNA break on the other side of the molecule, therefore now intertwining them. So you still you have one part of the chromosome is laid over the next. The helix makes contact at two different places. Now those are going to be broken and passed through, and then it's going to be fixed on the other side. And by that you have generated now two negative supercoils at the time. So the enzyme is constantly adding two supercoils to the system. 
When we look at the enzyme, the enzyme is going to have to use DNA um, and ATP in order for it to function. So you're going to have the gyrase enzyme, which is shown over here as this um, structure that is going to bind to the DNA. And once it binds to the DNA and hydrolyzes ATP, you're going to add two supercoils into the template. The enzyme is going to rotate twice at 360 degrees. So that means that it's, the total rotation is going to be 720. And because of that, it's going to add two negative supercoils, providing opportunities to then wrap itself around and add more supercoils. So this image from a publication from PubMed Center, um, it's showing you how the enzyme binds and once ATP is hydrolyzed, it turns around twice, generates a double-stranded DNA break that then later it seals, and it will allow it to happen twice to allow to add two different supercoils, negative supercoils to the DNA molecule. Now, gyrus is also the enzyme that could be used to separate and resolve the interlock chromosomes that we saw before. So as you remember, once the circular chromosome is duplicated, you have two interlock chromosomes. So gyrase is able to bind to one of the strands, induce a double-stranded DNA break, and then transpose the other strand across, fix the double-stranded DNA break, and later release the two independent strands. Without the effect of topoisomerase 2, the chromosomes will not be resolved and they will continue to duplicate, forming sort of like a chain link. So the enzyme topoisomerase 2 is extremely important to separate the chromosomes during the division of the cell. Now its cousin, topoisomerase 1, it creates now a single DNA break and that instead of adding supercoils, it relaxes the supercoils. So it allows the DNA molecule to unwind around the axis of the intact strand, releasing some of the tension, and therefore it's going to have now one less turn per nick that the enzyme allows. So every time that the enzyme works, it releases one turn, which releases a supercoil. So it allows the release and the relaxation of the DNA molecule. We're going to see that later that it's going to be important to help the um, chromosome relax as gyrase is adding supercoils during replication. Topoisomerase 1 is relaxing some of them, otherwise topo, uh, the DNA replication is not going to be completed as the molecule can no longer be separated. So. Negative supercoiling, it is made possible because of the presence of the proteins that are binding the DNA and generating those supercoil domains. And that fixes an area in a compact state that is then able to be released by gyrase, by the, excuse me, it's going to be released by topoisomerase 1 to allow the molecule to be replicated, for example. So let's now take another look at the information flow in microorganisms. We're going to see that, as you know, there are going to be three processes involved in genetic flow. So think about what are they. We'll discuss that more in the flip lecture tomorrow. And how are these processes different from eukaryotes and prokaryotes? So let's take a look at what they are. As you know, you're going to have DNA replication. That is one of the mains in which information flow from daughter cells, from mother to daughter, the DNA is replicated, carrying information with it. Now, during transcription, you have the, the take, you take the information in the DNA and now you put it in an RNA molecule. And translation is able then to take that nucleotide information and translate it into the protein language of amino acids. So you have replication as one of the processes of information flow, transcription as the second process, and translation as the third. So let's take a moment to look at the gene organization in microbial cells. As I mentioned to you in the previous table, 
Viruses have either a DNA or RNA single-stranded or double-stranded genome. They could be circular or linear, and they usually are quite small and have about 25 genes. Not a lot of information that you can fit in a viral capsule. Now, prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria included, both of them have double-stranded DNA genomes, and most of them are circular, either having one chromosome, though some of them has two or three. They're usually haploid, and they contain plasmids, which give you uh, beneficial but not essential genes. Their genomes are relatively small, between 0.5 to 8 million bases, some of them 9 million, as we showed you earlier, and they contain about 1,000 genes per microorganism, so E. coli has about 4,000. That is very different from eukarya, where you have, again, double-stranded DNA, but the chromosomes are linear, usually diploid in most cases, though there are some haploid organisms. They contain organelles, which have circular genomes, and plasmids are very rare. When we add humans to this equation, humans have about 3.10 to the 9 base pairs in the genome and contain about, about 100,000 genes. So the question is, why are eukaryotic genomes so much larger than prokaryotic genomes? And that is going to be the subject of the next section of the lecture. So remember that in uh, eukaryote, the cell shown into the right, the genes are organized in discrete sections called exons. Those are going to be the parts that encode for protein. And the exons are separated by introns, which are non-protein coding regions. When the RNA is transcribed, you're going to have an initial transcription of a template that contains exons and introns. But after RNA processing, the introns are removed and you have a mature RNA that is later exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it can then be translated. And that will give you a protein. Prokaryotes, in the other hand, as I mentioned to you, contain the genes organized in operons. And the operons can have many different genes associated, but when they are transcribed from the, from the chromosome, they are encoded as one poly RNA molecule that contains then multiple proteins when translation happens. Very few prokaryotes have introns. I think that archaea are some of the ones who have, can contain some of the introns. Now, when we look at the proportion of the genome that has encoding for proteins in prokaryotes, we're going to see that it's a lot larger than the, the proportion of the genome encoding proteins in eukaryotes. Take an example of human. Out of the entire human genome, only 1.4% of that genome is protein encoding. When you look at E. coli, 86% of the genome encodes for proteins. So bacteria, including E. coli, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and Archaeoglobulus fulgidus, most of them have greater than 86% of their chromosome encoding protein. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, like Drosophila, C. elegans and our Arabidopsis has less than 30% of their genome encoding proteins. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the yeast, it's an exception to that, which about 70% of its genome encoding protein. That is shown here in the gray area. So how it is that the bacterial genomes have a greater organization of protein coding regions than the eukaryotes? And that is the image shown over here. So if you take the look of the entire chromosome, 88% um, of the bacterial chromosome of E. coli encodes for open reading frames, which are the area encoding for proteins. 10% of that chromosome is going to have regulatory sequences, the promoters, the operators that are controlling the open reading frames. As I mentioned, only 1% of that area has RNA ribosome and RNA, or transfer RNA. And only 0.5% of the genome has non-coding repetitive sequences. So it is a very compact genome where no information is wasted with introns. Okay. On the other hand, eukaryotic chromosomes contain very vast areas of non-coding repeated sequences, as, of, as well as the introns in between the exons. So the smallest bacterial genome is Mycoplasma genitalum, which has about half a million base pairs. 
and only encodes about 470 genes. E. coli, on the other hand, as we mentioned here in the arrow, has a genome of 4.6 million bases with 4,288 genes. Now, by the Rhizobium japonicum, it's the largest known genome in bacteria with about 9 million base pairs and 8,000 genes. And that microorganism needs those genes because it's one of the nitrogen-fixing microorganisms in a symbiotic relationship with soybeans. Nanoarchaeum equitans have a small genome of 490,000 base pairs with 552 genes. So it's very small. So as you can appreciate from these two tables, the size of the genome varies according to the microorganisms, and some of them are going to be small and other ones are going to be larger, especially microorganisms that have um, particular metabolic pathways that they are going to explore, like methanogenesis, for example. Um, they will require uh, a larger genome to perform their functions. Now let's take a look at the last genetic element that I want to explore today, and those are going to be the plasmids. The plasmids, as we mentioned, are extra chromosomal units. Here is the bacterial chromosome of an E. coli, all unwound in multiple supercoils. And this small image is one over here in the uh, orange box, but those are, both of them are shown here with uh, white arrows, are the plasmids. They're usually about less than 10,000 base pairs, circular in most microorganisms, so some of them are linear. Now they have their own independent origin replication and are independently replicated from the chromosome. Some of them have what we call high copy number, which basically means that they are going to replicate very fast and therefore the cell will have a lot of them. And other ones have a low copy number, which basically indicates that they have um, a slow replication mechanism. Now, most of these plasmids do not have an extracellular form, like a virus when it is encoded in the capsid, that is considered an extracellular form. Now, as I mentioned, plasmids have unessential but beneficial genes. And having plasmids, we're going to see, is going to be very important to many microorganisms to comfort them advantages in um, virulence, nitrogen fixation, symbiotic relationships, as well as antibiotic resistance. So some of them are cells transmissible. They contain all the genes necessary for them to transfer, and we're going to see that through the process of conjugation. And other ones are non-self transmissible, which basically stay in the cell and may require some helper function to be perhaps transmitted to another organism. So we tend to call the plasmids um, encoding cells to be male and the plasmid not encoding cells to be female for some reason. Now, they can have genes that are going to involve infertility to allow the plasmid to be passed from the male to the female. We have genes for drug resistance, virulence factors, including toxins, and of course, a lot of genes involved in particular metabolic pathways. So here is another um, indication about this. For example, streptomyces have antibiotic production in plasmids. Conjugation, which is going, we're going to see that is the way in which microorganisms can pass uh, uh, DNA from one organism to the next, happens through plasmids. Metabolic functions like degradation of herbicides, lactose, sucrose, and urea utilization, pigment production, gas vesicle production, all of those are found in plasmids. Antibiotic and toxic metal resistant genes are found in plasmids. And we're going to see that many of the virulence genes that allow microorganisms to be better at invading and um, either as a symbiotic inv invasion or as a um, detrimental infection, they are going to be encoded with plasmids, including the toxins. Now, this is one of the plasmids that we're going to learn a lot about, and it's the fertility plasmid. It's called the F plasmid. The F plasmid, as shown over here in this image, uh, contains some genes called TRA, which are required for transfer of the plasmid to the next. That is going to include the machinery, including the pili, that is going to allow for conjugation to happen. So it is an episome, meaning that it can integrate into the host chromosome and replicate with the chromosome then. 
some plas not all plasmids are episomes. Some of them are going to stay as extra chromosomal entities dividing on their own when they need to. But from time to time, we're going to see that plasmids through this IS3 or IS2 regions, um, insertion regions, we're going to see that they're going to have homology with IS regions in the chromosome of the bacteria and therefore use them to integrate the plasmid into the chromosome. The other plasmid that I would like to introduce you to is the R100 resistant plasmid or the R plasmid. It has about 115 genes, most of them for antibiotic resistance. And it is the bane of the medical community because it has a lot of those genes that allow the microorganism to now become resistant to different antibiotics used medically. So it spreads really rapidly through many bacterial populations and it includes heterocycling, chloramphenicol, streptomycin, mercury, and ethidium bromate resistant. As you can see also, it has some of the IS sequences that allow it to uh, integrate and it has a transposon here called TN10. We're going to learn more about the transposons later. So to finalize, microbial genomes come in many features that have made it useful for molecular biologies. Their small size allow them to be sequenced really easily so then we can understand how do the genes are organized and use them to cloning. They can be manipulated uh, through mutations to identify gene function because of their mechanism of duplication and their circular nature, they're easily scalable for cloning projects. And since they can contain antibiotic resistances, we can put selective markers that are going to allow us to select for clones really easily. With that, I'll conclude the lecture and I will be ready for a quiz for you students on Tuesday. Bye-bye.